A South American Mystery. I'm Jason Horton. I'm Rebecca Lieb. And this is Ghost Town. On April 1st, 2014, tourists Chris and Lizanne awakened, ready for an adventure. They were young, best friends, and Dutch students who had been touring around Panama, and that morning they decided to explore the area. They left their hosts, a local family, and went towards town. Among mysterious text messages, a found backpack, a bungled investigation, and a bleached bone, the two would never return. Today, we're talking about the mysterious disappearance of Chris Kremers and Lizanne Froon. 21-year-old Chris Kremers and 22-year-old Lizanne Froon arrived in Panama for a six-week vacation on March 15, 2014. For two weeks, they toured Panama and eventually arrived in Bouquet. There, their plan was to live with a local host, volunteering with children and learning Spanish. And things seemed to go as planned, or at least according to their Facebook posts, which described their adventures and goals for the trip, particularly on April 1st. The two wrote on Facebook that on April 1st, their plan for the day would be walking around Bouquet and seeing the sights. Both Chris and Lizanne grew up in Amersfoort and were similar in their personality and goals. Chris was described as an open, creative, responsible person. Lizanne was described as optimistic, intelligent, passionate. Kremers had just completed her studies in cultural social education, specializing in art education at the University of Utrecht. Brune had graduated with a degree in applied psychology from Deventer and was an avid volleyball player. The two met and became close friends after working together at a cafe called In Den Klein and Hap in Amsfort. And again, I'm sorry if I get these names wrong. They are Dutch. When they each graduated college, the two started planning a Costa Rican trip to learn Spanish and also to be kind of a graduation gift for Frune. The company they used was called Spanish at Location, an immersion language school based in both Costa Rica and Panama. Spanish at Location is all about learning Spanish, you guessed it, at a location. It's an immersive travel experience where people learn Spanish by interacting with locals, doing community work, and like being just a part of their surroundings. Which is what the two were really all about. Although Costa Rica was their first choice, they chose to travel to Panama instead, where they would spend two weeks in the province of Boca del Toro, getting the foundations of the language. Then they would go to the province of Chiriqui in the village of Boque, where they would continue learning the language while doing community work at Casa Ora, a hostel for high-risk children. Only a few weeks before leaving for Panama, Froon moved in with Kremers in a dorm room in Amsfort, saving up money for the trip. But let's get back to April 1st, 2014. The two left their hosts and went out to Bouquet for a hike into the forest that surrounded the Baru Volcano and the El Pianista Trail. It was not a far hike, and really, no big deal. Or it should have been no big deal. Think of it as more of like a neighborhood walk than a hike. Not really a big deal at all, according to those familiar with it. The two left with light clothing, tank tops and shorts, with a light backpack containing passports, a water bottle, a Canon PowerShot SX270 some money, around $80, and their cell phones, an iPhone and a Samsung Galaxy. Before they left, witnesses saw Froon and Kremers having lunch with two young men. Eyewitnesses also believed the men were Dutch like them, and similar to men they had visited during their first two weeks of their stay. Some sources say the woman took a dog that belonged to the owners of Il Pianista Restaurant. This has not been confirmed. So the two set out on their hike. And again, by hike, I want to emphasize it was really more like a walk to the people of the village. A little bit later, Froon takes some photos that show that they had probably taken a trail towards the overlook of the Continental Divide and wandered into the jungle. But again, this doesn't feel panicked or unusual. It just feels like they're in this place. It's exciting. It's a little bit scary. They're excited about what they might find. They don't feel threatened or uncomfortable. A couple hours later, around 4.30, a call is placed from Kremers' phone for 112, the international emergency number used in Panama. Froon's phone also calls 112 12 minutes later. Neither of the calls go through due to lack of reception in the area. Apparently, later that night, the owners of the restaurant became alarmed when their dog returned home alone. Again, this is unsubstantiated. It's a story that I've heard from multiple sources, but cannot be confirmed. 
Also that day, Froon and Kramer's parents stopped receiving text messages, which both women had been sending to their families daily, if not more than that. On the morning of April 2nd at 6.58 a.m. and then 8.14 a.m., Froon and Kramer's attempt to call 112. At 10.52 a.m., Froon calls 112 and 911 from her phone. 911 also is in use in Panama at the time, but because of these girls' place of origin, 112 probably felt more comfortable. A little bit later that morning, the authorities are notified of the women's disappearance when Kremers and Froon missed an appointment with a local guide. At 1.50, Froon checks her signal once, and then again at 4.19 p.m. Some sources have stated that one call on this day did get through and got connected and lasted for a little over a second before breaking up, but this information has not been confirmed, and obviously a second of a 911 call would not be super helpful. On April 3rd, authorities began actual aerial searches of the forest and local residents started searching themselves. At 7.36, Froon's phone is turned off. Later that morning, Kremers tries 911 and checks her signal twice. Froon's phone is dead and never is used again. On April 6th, the parents of Kremers and Froon arrive in Panama along with police, dog units, and detectives from the Netherlands to conduct a full-scale search at the forest for 10 days. At this point, the parents offer a $30,000 reward for any information leading to the whereabouts of Kremers and Froon. No information came of it that I could find. Kremers' iPhone would have power until the 11th, but would not make any more calls. Instead, and probably more eerily, Kremers' phone is intermittently turned on to search for reception. Kremers' iPhone was turned on multiple times between April 5th and 11th, but without ever entering the correct PIN code again. Either no PIN code at all, or a wrong PIN code was entered. Another and probably most memorable part of this case is, on April 8th, 90 flash photos were taken between 1 a.m. and 4 a.m., apparently deep in the jungle and in near-complete darkness. A few photos show that they were possibly near a river or a ravine. It's really hard to say. Some show a twig with a plastic bag on top of a rock. Another shows what looks like a backpack strap and a mirror on another rock. And another shows the back of Kremer's head. They are, again, very, very disturbing photos. And like a lot of parts of this case, you can find them online if you want to, again, speculate, um, see piece together for yourself. Another point of speculation is a photo on Froon's camera. The photo is IMG number 508. It is the last photo taken by Lizanne and Chris, but there are two versions of photo 508. The photo is of Chris Kramer looking backward. It, again, also very creepy. So it shows in the camera's metadata that it was taken eight seconds after photo 507, But another version of the same photo states that this last photo of Chris looking backward was taken 50 seconds before the previous photo of her passing kind of by a creek. This could be photo manipulation by someone, the girls deleting the photo themselves, someone else downloading it, or something else entirely. On April 11th, Kremer's phone was turned on at 1051 and was turned off for the last time at 1056. Ten weeks later, a woman stumbled across a discarded backpack while she was tending to her rice paddy. The backpack was Froon's and contained items that belonged to both Froon and Kremers, including both their phones and Froon's camera. This is how we kind of know about all of this stuff. The pictures they took, the phones turning on and off, and that Kremers placed 77 emergency phone calls between the 7th and the 11th of April before the phone was turned off for the last time. The discovery of the backpack led to new searches along the river, and soon remains were found. Kremer's denim shorts were on a rock a couple miles away from where Froon's backpack had been discovered. The woman who found them said that the shorts were found zipped and neatly folded, but pictures of the shorts, published in 2021, show them in disarray. Two months later, closer to where the backpack was discovered, a pelvis and a boot with a foot inside were found. Soon, at least 33 widely scattered bones were discovered along the same riverbank. DNA testing confirmed they belonged to Kremers and Froon. Froon's bones still had some skin attached to them, but Kremers' bones appeared to have been bleached. A Panamanian forensic anthropologist later said that under magnification, quote, there are no discernible scratches of any kind on the bones, neither of natural nor cultural origin. There are no marks on the bones at all. Let's take a break. This episode is brought to you by Paranormal Activity Next of Kin. 
the activity is reborn. A documentary filmmaker follows his friend Margot as she heads to a secluded Amish community. While there, Margot hopes to learn about her biological family, but encounters unexplainable events that haunt her. Paranormal Activity Next of Kin, now streaming exclusively on Paramount+. Plus. Rated R. The Timberwolves select Kevin Garnett from Farragut Academy. A high school kid? No chance. You saw the future of what basketball was about to become. He does whatever it takes to win a basketball game. All I know is all out. I want to be challenged to the end. Kevin Garnett, Anything is Possible. Friday, 8, 7 central on Showtime. Hi, hello, how are you doing? Hello. We hope you are well. We want to say thank you for listening. Thank you for supporting the podcast. Thank you to our patrons and to our government. The mayors, Ashley Matson. Hello. David Bull. Hello. Dara Rosenzweig. Hello. And James Harrington. Hello. And our fearless leader, sitting in her ghost town mansion, paid for by the taxpayers, Avian Noble. Hello. So if you want early access with no chit-chat or ads, bonus episodes, go to patreon.com slash ghost town pod. All right, let's get back into it. So what the hell happened? It, you know, really comes down to them being murdered by people um, maybe they were with, maybe who found them, or succumbing to the elements. Um, it kind of reminds me of the... Delphi murders that we uh, discussed in an earlier episode, where we have a little bit of technological evidence, but we really have to piece together the story that will never really be solved. Um, and I think, you know, people talk about something in the woods, they talk about UFOs, they talk about the girls turning on each other. I just don't think that that is what it is. I think we have enough to go on to kind of figure out maybe a little bit what's happening, but enough inconsistencies that we can't really make a conclusive statement about what occurred that day or in that next series of days, that week. So the trail they left on is tame, but it turns treacherous really quickly. The area beyond the trail is very rugged, steep, dangerous, particularly during the April wet season, where to get back up and out of it, you have to cross a steep river gorge up to 70 feet using kind of these rickety cable bridges. In the river gorges where the woman's things were found are several semi-abandoned Nagobe structures, structures made by the area's native people, often used as kind of last camps for travelers who are in really bad trouble. We know pretty certainly that the women died close to each other, but how and when and why are all up for speculation. There are those inconsistencies, things folded, not folded, the cell phone code they were trying to use, bleached bones, missing photographs that raise just a lot of questions, you know, before you have to go to anything super far-fetched. Initially, neither the Dutch nor Panamanian forensic teams could provide a cause of death, and the Panamanian authorities thought that the women both fell off a bridge and were washed away by the raging river. The Dutch police thought the deaths were likely an accident, but some of the Panamanian police and Dutch private investigators strongly believed that the deaths could have been foul play, given some of the strange evidence we mentioned. The case was first officially declared a homicide and, quote, a crime against personal integrity by Panama's attorney general. But in October of 2014, two forms from the Panamanian state officials described the deaths as a case of abduction. When Panamanian forensic teams failed to agree, the case was closed and considered an accident. They believed that Lizanne and Chris decided to continue into the jungle and slipped or had some kind of accident. According to officials, Crummers fell first, Fromm tried to help her, then photographed her remains in the dark and continued on, until she also fell, broke her ankle and foot, maybe falling into the river and dying there. But a lot of experts say the images and technology, really the major things helping us understand this case, were absolutely tampered with. Their backpack was found placed specifically next to a river, completely dry, and all the electronics were in working order. Also, not all of their body parts were found. And those that were, half of Chris's pelvis was bleached. Maybe from being out there for a long time, though it would have to take, like, tens of hundreds of years, really, to be bleached, to have a bone bleached by the sun. 
but maybe it was found and bleached by a human and replaced, for reasons we don't understand. Several forensic anthropologists think not finding the remains makes no sense, and the bleaching also makes no sense. And I have to agree. (laughs) Remember the two Dutchmen that they probably lunched with? Well, the two men were questioned by authorities and apparently cleared and released. So they had to have some kind of story or alibi, but again, I can't find what specifically that would be. So somebody either did this to these women, they died tragically in the wilderness, or somehow they turned on each other. I don't think that would be the case. There's no indication that they got into a fight or that they had any conflict based on the the camera and the phones. Um, You know, we would see maybe some evidence in the text messages to their parents that maybe they were having some friction or anything like that. I wish I had more information. Obviously, we all do to really piece together this story. I wish there was more from the parents and families and friends so we could get a sense of who these two women were. Maybe that could be helpful. Again, just like the Delphi murders, it's really hard to get a sense. But at least with that case, we have a lot of community members. We have a lot of parents and friends talking, giving us a little bit more than we have with this. I wish, you know, we could see a little bit more of the trail or or have people do enactments or be able to talk to the woman who found the remains um, and found the initial backpack. That would also be really helpful. It's really hard. It's in that strange time where everything isn't on technology. You know, everything is not existing on on someone's phone. We don't have as much records, but we have enough to give us these little breadcrumbs to help us try to piece this thing together. And I, you know, it's so tragic, obviously. It's so hard to wrap my head around and not having some things and having others makes it even more frustrating. The only people who really know what happened that day are Lizanne Froon and Chris Kremers and whomever else that they were with just a couple hours beyond a public, well-trod trail. Fall is a season of gathering that brings us together with warmth and color. So whether it's a birthday, anniversary, or a special event, celebrate your friends and family with a gorgeous bouquet from 1-800-Flowers.com. 1-800-Flowers makes it easy to find your reason and brighten someone's day with exclusive offers and great values on bouquets and arrangements. To order today, visit 1-800-Flowers.com slash tune in. That's 1-800-Flowers.com slash tune in. Fall is the most birthday-packed season of the year, so chances are you have a few celebrations coming up. Make sure your friends and family feel special with a gorgeous bouquet of roses from 1-800-Flowers.com. 1-800-Flowers makes it easy to send the perfect gift. 24 multicolored roses for just $39.99. To get 24 multicolored roses for just $39.99, Visit 1-800-Flowers.com slash tune in. That's 1-800-Flowers.com slash tune in. I can't let diabetes get in my way. So here's what I do. I wear the Dexcom G6. It continuously sends my glucose numbers to my phone. And the arrow shows me where I'm headed and how fast. Without finger sticks or scanning, making it much easier to keep my glucose in range. The more time I spend in range, the better I feel. And the more I can cross off my list. Don't let diabetes get in your way. Check out Dexcom.com slash in range. If your glucose alerts and readings from the G6 do not match symptoms or expectations, use a blood glucose meter to make diabetes treatment decisions. For a list of compatible devices, visit Dexcom.com slash compatibility.